The movie opens up in a maximum security penitentiary in Japan, where only the most notorious criminals are kept. Two guards are inspecting the cells one by one, and after a while, they come across the isolation cell, which apparently houses the most dangerous criminal in Japan, Suzuki. He is a middle-aged man who has been held captive for many years. After the guards leave, Suzuki smiles and takes out one of his teeth. A while later, the guards return to inspect the perimeter, but by this time, Suzuki is already out. One of the guards senses someone's presence and shows his torch around the place. However, Suzuki, showcasing his parkour skills, evades the light without making any noise. He then clings onto the wall until the guards resume their checking. Just then, the guards reach the isolation cell and realize that Suzuki has escaped. They immediately call for backup, and in no time, the place is surrounded by army generals. Meanwhile, we see Suzuki running through the penitentiary's roof while an alarm blares in the background. As he reaches a dead end, it suddenly starts raining and the movie goes into a flashback. Twelve years ago, a new batch of prisoners is brought to a medium security penitentiary. Among those prisoners is Suzuki, who is serving a ten-year sentence. He is a shy individual who never utters a word and has a strange upside-down Mount Fuji tattoo on his chest. We also get to know that Suzuki is notorious for escaping prisons, as he has already achieved the feat thrice. The guards are well aware of this fact, but they are certain that Suzuki won't be escaping this time around. In the next scene, Suzuki is escorted to his cell, which is a small room with a ventilator at the top. He stares at the ventilator as if he has something in his mind. Outside, a guard talks to the prison warden, Mr. Kanemura, and assures him that they will take care of Suzuki. However, when he peeks through the door, he finds that Suzuki has already escaped. In no time, the penitentiary organizes a large manhunt to track down the runaway criminal. They make an elaborate point to circle the entire town, believing that the criminal is a genius, or maybe they're just idiots. But surprisingly, they find him within 20 minutes, without even breaking a sweat. For some reason, Suzuki was running straight through the train tracks. Later, he is brought back to the same cell, but this time, his hands are cuffed. That ought to do it. Meanwhile, when a guard peeks through his door, he finds that Suzuki has covered his head with a blanket. Enraged, the guard shouts at Suzuki to sleep with his head out, because he doesn't like playing hide-and-seek. But the latter doesn't listen. As a result, he is badly beaten up. The next morning, we see the warden going through records of Suzuki's previous incarcerations. After a bit of research, he finds a strange coincidence. Every time Suzuki escaped from a prison, he was caught at the nearby train tracks almost immediately. At night, the warden, along with a guard, are on a routine checkup of the place. When they enter Suzuki's cell, they are taken aback to find that he has unlocked his handcuffs. The hot-tempered guard demands to know how Suzuki pulled off such a trick, but as usual, he remains silent. Because of this, he is once again punished. One day, Suzuki is seen playing with a small wire. He has somehow smuggled it inside his cell, and it is the same tool that is helping him unlock his handcuffs. To those of you who are thinking where he hides it, well, you know the answer. In the next scene, the warden leaves the prison to spend time with his family for a week. In his absence, the guards become complacent, and this gives Suzuki the perfect window to execute his plan. He takes out a roll of wire and tries unlocking the door with it. After a while, a guard finally arrives to inspect the place. When he peeks through the door, he notices that Suzuki has again slept with his head covered. However, this time he simply ignores it. Just then, we are shown that Suzuki is watching the guard from the ceiling. He has already escaped the cell, and now he is waiting for the right time to flee the building. When the guard leaves, he climbs further up until he reaches the top. He then punches a soft spot in the roof, makes a hole, and gets the hell out of the place. When the guards catch wind of this, they immediately raise the alarm. The warden also finds out about the escape and decides to return to the prison. The next morning, as the officials are planning the manhunt, the warden arrives. He suggests to the group that they cancel all of their plans and instead send a single team to the nearby railway tracks. The officials are stunned as they believe that Suzuki is not stupid enough to hide in the same location, but when the warden tells them he is sure, they agree. Surprisingly, his prediction comes true, and the runaway criminal is again captured near the tracks. It seems as if all his intelligence wanes off as soon as he exits the prison, or maybe he just really likes choo-choos.
The following day, the warden is rewarded for his quick thinking and is promoted to a high-ranking position at the Ministry of Justice. Now, he has to leave his duties at the prison. His new task is to visit various penitentiaries around the country and inspect the living conditions of the prisoners. On the other hand, Suzuki again breaks from his cell and is again apprehended near the train tracks. With each year passing by, he gets transferred to several penitentiaries, but none of them can hold him inside. Because of this, the media dubs him as the breakout king, and he becomes a cultural icon. I'd have called him David Train. At one point, he becomes so popular that even the kids start idolizing him. Following this, the movie fast forwards by 12 years, where Suzuki is being transferred to the central penitentiary. This time, he is under strict surveillance, as a bunch of guards have been assigned just to look after him. Even his cell is a nightmare. It is entirely made of concrete and has several locks on the door. Here, we get to know that the cell is the same isolation cell that we saw at the start of the movie. As soon as the guards leave, Suzuki scans the entire cell and tries to find anything that can help him escape. One day, a guard arrives with food and places it inside Suzuki's cell. As he prepares to leave, Suzuki suddenly handcuffs him and tries to to hurt him. As a result, the guard blows his whistle and calls for backup. In no time, several men arrive and beat Suzuki to a pulp. After he regains consciousness, he peeks through the small opening in the door and tracks the guard's movements. As he is doing so, blood drips from his face and soaks the iron bars. The next morning, the guards add a few extra screws in Suzuki's handcuffs, hoping that he cannot open it this time. Before leaving, they dish out another brutal punishment on him. In this way, Suzuki starts passing his days. He deliberately attacks the guards, gets beaten up, and soaks the iron bars of his door with his own blood. One day, the guards beat him up so badly that one of his teeth falls out. Surprisingly, Suzuki picks it up and starts smiling, as if he had planned it all along. In the next scene, Suzuki is seen drawing something on the wall with his tooth. When a guard arrives, he immediately places the tooth in its original position, inside his mouth. A few weeks later, Suzuki attacks yet another guard. This time, he crosses all boundaries and is given the ultimate punishment. They bring out a long chain, tie him up with it, and make him stand in a difficult posture. Days pass by, but he is still in the same condition. One day, in a shocking turn of events, Suzuki starts singing. It is finally revealed that he can speak week. The movie then fast forwards by a year, and poor Suzuki is still going through the punishment. He has started looking like a castaway, and maggots are seen running through his hands, where he has been cuffed. Fortunately, that evening, the guards enter his cell and eventually take the chains off. As a result, he finally gets to rest after an entire year. Meanwhile, ex-warden Mr. Kanemura arrives at the penitentiary to inspect the facilities there. When he approaches the isolation cell, he notices a sick and fragile Suzuki. However, he simply ignores him and walks away. Next, we are taken to the same night that we saw at the start of the movie. When it starts thundering outside, Suzuki sets his plan into motion. It appears as if he has been waiting for this day for over a year. He takes out his tooth and starts opening the screws of his cuffs. Here, we get to know that Suzuki was not drawing on the walls, but in fact, he was just sharpening his tooth so that it could fit the screws. After setting himself free from the cuffs, he approaches the door and starts shaking its metal bars. Surprisingly, due to the constant dripping of blood, the metal bars have become rusty and they easily come off. With this, he escapes his cell and eventually the entire place. In the following scene, we are taken to the past. On the day Suzuki was born, his mother dies due to delivery complications while his father is rotting inside jail. Due to this, he is raised by his extended family. One day, as Suzuki is practicing his parkour skills in the woods. He is suddenly approached by his runaway father. The two bond for a while, and Suzuki notices the same tattoo on his father's chest. Unfortunately, their meeting is cut short when some officers arrive and begin chasing the dad. Seeing this, Suzuki thinks he's probably not coming back with milk and vows to meet his father someday. Back to the present, Suzuki is again running through the tracks. When he is stopped by Mr. Kanemura, the ex-warden asks him to stop, and surprisingly, he obliges. After a while, a group of guards arrive at the scene and take him away. Seeing that even the most fortified of penitentiaries could not hold Suzuki, the head of the criminal department orders Mr. Kanemura to escort Suzuki to the deadliest prison on Earth, the Prison Isle. The Prison Isle is like no other penitentiaries. It is located in the middle of the ocean, with extremely dangerous currents on all sides, and more importantly, no damn trains nearby. Furthermore, the nearby waters also contain sharks, hence making escape impossible. 
The insides of the penitentiary are equally terrifying. Hundreds of guards are sanctioned around the place, and if a prisoner tries to escape, they are shot on sight. The prisoners are also given poison food, which slowly makes them go insane. The hell's the point of that? When Suzuki arrives at the place, he is immediately locked inside his cell. The cell is just a bunch of rods put together, which constricts Suzuki around his whole body. As a result, he is not allowed to move an inch, let alone escape. Elsewhere, Mr. Kanemura enters the prison library and starts searching for information about Suzuki. After a bit of searching, he eventually gets some old files and goes through them. Back inside the prison, Suzuki is meditating inside his cell. Although escaping from the place seems impossible, he seems to have an idea in mind. After a while, he ends his meditation and opens his eyes. He then dislocates both of his shoulders and slowly gets out of the tiny confinement. A prisoner notices him in the act, but since he is too intoxicated, he doesn't say a damn word. Meanwhile, as Mr. Kanemura is still engrossed in his research, the alarm and the island goes off. However, instead of being worried, the prison warden becomes happy as there is virtually no way to escape the island. He is also delighted that his guards finally have an opportunity to kill a prisoner. Mr. Kanemura tries to tell him that Suzuki is a genius, but the warden ignores him and tells them that they will begin the search operation the next morning. In the morning, several guards are dispatched all across the island, and each one of them is carrying a rifle. As the warden is briefing the rest of his men, Mr. Kanemura suddenly arrives and informs them that Suzuki is in fact looking for his dad, who is also incarcerated on the island. This surprises everyone, and here, the truth is finally revealed. It turns out that everything was Suzuki's plan all along. He deliberately got himself into prison and escaped each time so that he could finally reach Prison Isle. His main mission is to find his dad and escape with him. Elsewhere, Suzuki finally meets his dad, and the duo has an emotional reunion. Unfortunately, Mr. Kanemura, the warden, and a horde of other men are also arriving at the same location. Surprisingly, when they reach there, Suzuki and the old man are already gone. In the final scene of the movie, Suzuki takes his dad to the edge of the island, where he has a paraglider ready. The two board the glider and fly away from the place. Meanwhile, Mr. Kanemura tries interrogating an old man who lived in the same room as Suzuki's dad. Just then, he notices the same tattoo on this man's chest and is taken aback. The movie ends as Mr. Kanemura narrates that after all these years of planning, Suzuki has escaped with the wrong man. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.